for coming and for bringing uh, all these treats we have on the table here. Uh, but I want to like get the rest of the night going here. Uh, our greatest treat tonight is having the presence of George Papa George. Am I as yummy as the goose? <laughs> <laughs> as sweet as the pies. Um, well done. These smooth operas. So we're so delighted to have him here. He is the director of the Family Wellness Ministry of our metropolis. And he's a, a MFT, a marriage family therapist. Um, I always tell people that George is so in touch with like the needs of our generation in our day and age. and. Uh, it's a delight every time to hear him speak, so um, we're really happy to have you here. So let's uh, give him a round. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jeff. Thanks a lot uh, for asking me. And, and definitely, as he knows, because I spoke, who was at uh, the fall retreat? Was it a couple years ago? Okay, right on. Yay. Yes. I, I think I My people. Yeah, it changed your life. I remember. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I was, uh, so, so some of you, you know, might hear a couple things I've said before, but uh, we're going to be talking about just the idea of getting love right, and um, I, I come before you as a marriage family therapist, been doing that for about 30 years, um, I come before you as a dad of two, my daughter is uh, going to be 22 next month, and she's a senior at Boulder, University of Colorado Boulder, and my son is 17, junior, we live across the bay in Danville. And, uh, but this is my home church from my childhood, so I'm always super stoked to be here. That's always a special, like, deja vu, can this even be, I love it, and so. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you, indeed. And then my mom grew up in this church, and she was born in 1924. Wow. So we have some history of Holy Trinity, and she was a saint, and just a sweetheart. So, so it's special for me to be here at, on, all, on all of those levels. Definitely the idea of relationships, and we'll talk a little bit about it. I have I, my PowerPoint is going to be my notes. I'll look at that at some point, but um, and I know I won't even get through all of it. But definitely the idea of, and I want to get some of your ideas. But whatever goes on in relationships tends to be very um, not only important to us. But in a way, and I don't know if the word expose is too harsh of a word, but it, it exposes who we are. Now, the good thing about that is to get love right, we're meant to use the inner life. So the good thing about who we are being exposed and coming out in relationships is we better find out what's going on in there because that's the depth of what we need to know. In fact, when it comes to self-awareness, people that are not self-aware, usually everyone around them is more aware of them than they are of themselves. And we almost don't want to fall into that population. So this idea of getting love right has something to do with the inner life, and certainly that even as Jesus would say, even when he said, you know, big deal when you love your friends, but it's when you love your enemies that love is really going to take on a form that it was meant to be. So this idea of love, uh, have you heard of Bumble? Yeah. Uh, we didn't have that in my day. Um, dating, yeah. And I think it's when the woman buzzes in. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I was just talking to a client, and I've known her forever through a lot of different relationships, and she brought her new guy, and they met on Bumble, so I was getting educated on Bumble. <laughs> um, but getting love, love is something that's sought out by most people, but getting it right, I want to you know, kind of make that distinction. How do we know we're getting it right? So let me ask you guys, um, if we started off with this idea of getting love right, and we just did that for a second, and we put that. What are some insights you guys have that give us a clue that we're getting love wrong? What would need to be true about us, true about how we are or behave, or true about the relationship? What's a sign that we're getting love wrong? Inner turmoil. Okay, so in, inner turmoil, yeah. So that's interesting. Um, 
So we'd say that if we're getting love wrong, we might be in the relationship, we might even be hooked on the relationship, but there might be something on the inside that's saying, oh, something doesn't feel right. What else would give us a clue that we're getting love wrong? Fighting. What's that? Fighting. Okay, so conflict. Conflict. What else? It affects your relationships with your friends, too. Okay, Negative good, yeah. Um, Negative friendship. Yeah, so, yeah, negative uh, effect uh, with friends and sometimes family. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an interesting insight on, I'm in love, they're the best, everybody I ever knew hates them, <laughs> but they just don't understand them, you know, or something like that. So that, that could be a clue. What, and by the way, the non-clinical but beautiful definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over but expecting different results. So sometimes if we want to get love right, we should have like kind of a cheat sheet on what when we get love wrong, what that looks like. Sometimes, literally, sometimes the greatest decision making we can have is what have I learned from experience that's, that's stuff not to do? So what else would give us just a clue that we're getting love wrong or that the relationship is getting love wrong, yeah? Falling away from Christ. Okay, so we, we could say uh, not Christ-centered. And usually if we're not Christ-centered, what centered are we? Yeah, so sometimes even relationship-centered. You know, like, I actually found my source of life. When we might say, according to John 15, that uh, he is the vine, we are the branches, that he is the source of life, and all of a sudden we find this alternate source of life. What else comes to mind? Getting love wrong. Uh, Isolating yourself, like always spending time. Okay, yeah. So definitely related to this, isolation, which sometimes on one hand could be I'm kind of addicted, and so addicts usually isolate. And we don't often equate relationships with addiction, but we'll even play off that point a little to say very often when we start discovering that we're getting love wrong, we actually have more of an addictive relationship with the person, which leads to an isolating, which often leads to the friends and family kind of like, oh, they just bug me now. I just never knew they were that way. We get all these like supposed epiphanies that everybody else is wrong or that we start isolating because we're, we have this addictive pull. Um, or getting love wrong related to isolation could be that we might be someone who they, they insist that their love is really the only one that we need to worry about, and so they can get possessive and controlling. So none of you said controlling yet, right? Has anyone ever experienced a controlling relationship? What, go, what, what happens in controlling relationships? Well, they never do what I want them to do. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Confession is on his way back. Like, that was smooth. What else can we learn from controlling relationships? What do we, what do we find in those? Um, this is second hand, but they make the person feel guilty um, along the time. Yeah, so a lot of times with control, the, you're trying to be in that relationship, but somehow you get to being left feeling like there's something wrong with you. You're just not quite getting it right according to them. So I want us to, so just from that standpoint, I just want us to start off with a little bit of um, a little bit of reflection because in a way, every relationship, every relationship we have, we think it's sort of about the relationship, but I want us to keep in mind every relationship we have is really about self-knowledge. It's about you're going to find out something about yourself every time. And that's a pretty good inventory to keep. Because the easy inventory is like, okay, they bug for that reason, I don't like that. Okay, that's good to keep that inventory. But what did I discover about myself? Because that kind of education, that kind of inventory actually does us a lot of good, okay? So, um, let's see what else we could say. Um, 
Yeah, so let's let's keep that in mind. And we're going to look at th just three ideas. Um, I might as well open this thing up since I brought it. But um, now also, here's my family, by the way. There they are. Um, is someone dating Lucy or something like that? No. Um, and, uh, 
we just eat goose. <laughs> yeah, right, no. So this was one of the injuries of his childhood, right? So he told the story of how he, his mom said, oh, go get Lucy. And he's like, okay, mom. Oh. No. Oh, no. And they had Lucy for dinner. Did she at least taste good? Yeah, Lucy Lucy was a hit, but um <laughs> so every every probably every couple months, my dad would say to my mom, oh let, let's have Lucy for dinner. So the word for having goose was Lucy. So I grew up with a special meal. I mean this was better than Thanksgiving. And we have almonds on it and you know, like little cool fat that around. And it was like and it was always like this amazing we ate at the dining room on Sunday nights and that's when we had Lucy. And so I grew up having it, right? Through, through the years, right? I mean, it wasn't the same Lucy, it was in memory of Lucy. But um, anyway, so I, I just wanted to give a shout out to Lucy, okay? <laughs> oh, um, you, Lucy. Right. Good. Exactly. So, so, but you get my point on that it can be really painful when we have relationships and family that end up being hurtful relationships. Uh, there's a thing in psychology called double bind. One of the things that in the studies in psychology, when you get to know what a double bind is, it would be like, if I can think of one, it would be like if, uh, let's say, a little, a little daughter is, is crying in her room and mom hears her, and she, the mom goes in and says, oh, uh, you know, sweetie, what, what's the matter? Oh, I, nothing, nothing, nothing. No, really, you need to open up. I'm your mother. And it's really important you tell me. And the daughter kind of collects herself and kind of gets the courage to say this very vulnerable thing. And the daughter shares, well, it hurt my feelings that you made my friends go home early because you said we could play till 2 and you sent them home at noon. And that really hurt me. And the mother slaps her across the face. And says, how could you treat your mother that way? And leaves the room. She slams the door. That's a double bind. And double binds in studies of, of mental breakdowns sometimes have family relationships with a double bind. Where you're there extending with a certain way of, in a sense, faith, and then something horrific happens and it can't make sense. The one who loves me just did that to me. Interestingly, we can say the church could have double binds. The church is a place of acceptance and God's love. And yet, if we end up in even some sermons, in some traditions, can be... Um, I was running Bader Breakers one time. I regret it many times. But there's one particular time I couldn't help myself because what's true... There's many things that go on. Anybody ever read Bader Breakers? <laughs> Pure entertainment. Yeah, it's a blast. <laughs> But something interesting is, not only do a, a lot of creative people show up to that, but Christians show up. And you know what the Christians do? They hold 12-foot signs that literally says, God hates queers. That's a double mind. That's a sick, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and God hates queers. Right? And yet, we have rampant this idea of certain judgmental positions in judgmental ways that they have some notion around things like what the Bible teaches and righteousness and things like that. But oh, oh, you know, holding a 12-foot sign, there's nothing about the love of God there. So we see that literally some people go crazy with the idea of Christianity and then have an atheist and we go, oh, poor them, they're an atheist, what's wrong with them? Very often, they're the, they're the, they're the victim of a double mind. So we want to just keep in mind that getting love right, we want to like get the toxins out of our system. We want to have a, a like, you know how, they, how clean eating is really in? We want to have like clean theology. We want to have clean psychology, okay? So, Another thing we could say in kind of this idea of wellness would be this idea of the studies you find in basic sports psychology. If you had to try to give a, a pop quiz on what is sports psychology or why is there sports psychology, what would you guys come up with? What, what, what is it? Who uses it? 
When is it used? Is it used for sports? Okay, good. You're, 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 you're good at correlation. Keep going. Coaches. Uh, coaches. Use it on coaches. Use it on players. What else do we know about sports psychology? It's when someone's not performing. They've been previously performing. performing and right. something happens. And so the performing. uniqueness of sports psychology, and pros encounter this all the time. You have a pro athlete, stacked, talented, committed, skilled, capable, gets it right, gets it right, gets it right, and then boom, he doesn't know what's going on, and he call it, you know, he gets in a slump. And when an athlete goes into a slump, so let's say a baseball player, home run hitter, base hit, you know, just very capable. And now he's striking out, striking out. Now he now his at bats look like this. What do you think is going on? What's that? Steroids, no. No, you keep hitting home runs. Uh, what do you think is going on for him? Mental. Some, okay, something mental, right? So in the world of sports, the term that's typically used is, oh no, he got into his head. When an athlete gets into his head, uh oh. So, when an athlete gets into his head, what's he doing? What's he doing up there? Overthinking. Oh, ooh, overthinking. What else is he doing? What's he thinking about? When he's overthinking. So he's guessing himself. Okay, yeah, he had a doubt. When he's in his head, what might he be focusing on? His performance. Yeah, performance. So, and what about if his performance might he be focusing on? No, not his failures. Okay, his failures. So it could be, and his failures, are they in, what time zone are the failures in? The past. The past. Good. So we could say when the athlete's in his head, he can be connected with his failures, he's in, in the past. What other focus could he be having related to his performance? Worries about future performance. Yes, so we have worries about future. So we can say that when an athlete's in their head, the two time zones for sure they're in is the past and the future. Okay. Past is regrets, failures, future is worries, or we can say what, what emotion goes with future? Anxiety. anxiety coming from fear. Fear-driven, experience anxiety, okay? Now, when an athlete gets a little bit of good sports psychology, what do you think the goal of that psychology is gonna be? Where does the, psych where does the psychologist wanna get them? Take them or back help them with. Back to the present. Moment. Back to the present. So here is head. Present moment. Where is it? Heart. In sports psychology, they call it the zone. Help the athlete to get in their zone. To find a way to block out that wobbly tendency to think about their failures, as well as their slippery slope of slipping into the future. And typically, they have some kind of relationship with performance. And this was gonna make the athlete extra vulnerable to falling in and getting in their head is, they might even believe that their value is based solely on performance. And so, who I am, how I am, is all on the line every time. Think about that pressure. And so when that pressure hits, we flip into the past, flip into the future. This is typically depressive, depression, and this is typically, the future is anxiety. This journey here is the present moment in the heart. So as we're thinking about getting love right, and I've got, a, I've got three points I'm still gonna make, but here we're building our foundation. If we're gonna get love right based on sports psychology, tell me a little bit about, based on this, what would we say about getting love right or what about this teaches us about relationships? You need to be in the present. Okay, so to be in the present, 
what's that look like to be in the present in a relationship? What's, what's it take for that individual to be in the present? Not to still be thinking about their past. Right, so, so I want us to see kind of that unique relationship here to say that you guys have what it takes to have loving, long-lasting relationships. In a sense, a qualifier would be how well do you do in your heart? How well do you do staying in the present? So kind of in way of introduction, I just want to say that very often what happens when we get into relationships is we get kind of performance-based. We think that our next move is going to totally define who we are, and we get vulnerable to slip into the past. If we just slip in the past, we're, trying to, we're just starting a new relationship, and we, we do what the athlete did, does, and we slip in the past, what starts happening to us? How does that mess up our relationship, possibly? Compare. Okay. Yes. Compare them. What else, do we, what else do we do to ourselves when we think about the past? Yeah, we can get into my performance from the past tells me I'm going to just doubt the heck out of myself. If we slip into the future mode, what, are we, what emotion are we experiencing? Anxiety. Okay, and so what kind of thinking goes when we go into our little future tripping when it comes to relationships? What, are we, what kind of things do we start predicting? Negative yes, negative outcomes. Negative outcomes. So I want us to be aware of some good sports psychology to say, hey, even on, even on a date, let alone a relationship, let alone meeting someone, you have, you're the good athlete. But don't get in your head. And we can see that sometimes we can be our own worst critic and start getting tangled in the mistakes of the past or for sure we get like kidnapped into what might go wrong. Literally, that athlete, he, when he used to be in the zone, all he, was, all he was concerned about is connecting, just make contact. And then that becomes hard, why? Because he's looking at the scoreboard, he's listening to the crowd, he's feeling watched. He's keeping track of his own track record, he's worried about his batting average. And we can start worrying about our batting average, we can start looking at the clock. We could say, oh, what if this doesn't work out? And then, and then, and then that, and then this, and then that. All of that is in our head. So, this idea then, when we start integrating good psychology with good theology, then we say, does your spiritual practices help you out of your head into your heart? In what way would a spiritual practice help you? out of your head into your heart. Do you think a spiritual practice can help you out of your head into your heart? It's supposed to. Right, it's supposed to. And, and I remember the first time I heard that was from Father uh, Mel Weber. You guys know mm -hmm. Mel Weber? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he was, he's a Scottish guy that went to Oxford as an English major mm -hmm. and came out an Orthodox priest. <laughs> And yeah, awesome, because Calistos Ware was the head of East Orthodox Studies at Oxford. Uh, he wrote the Orthodox Church, Orthodox Way, great author. He's retired now, I believe. Um, and he's a bishop, uh, Calistos Ware. Anyway, um, but I remember hearing Mel Weber, Father Mel Weber saying that he has this like really perfect little Scottish accent. Like, how do you not love people with a Scottish accent? <laughs> and but he was saying that the purpose of prayer, right when he said that, the purpose of prayer. I've always heard people say pray, and prayer is important, and prayer, pray this, pray that, but the purpose of prayer. He said the purpose of prayer is to help us get out of our head into our heart. When it comes to relationships, man, we get in our head like crazy. That can be like the big game for us. We feel the pressure. And depending on who we are, Maybe more pressure, all the, you know, like depending varying levels of pressure depending on who you are. So this idea of even how you do the prayer, even the whole idea. His contention was the beauty of the Jesus prayer is that centering prayer to get us from our head into our heart. So I want to share just a, a tad bit more on um, a couple.
couple things just to say as we're talking about maybe this idea of integrating healthy psychology, healthy theology. Uh, St. Isaac the Syrian, 6th century guy, right? St. Isaac says, to see yourself as you really are is a miracle greater than raise the dead. So his whole idea is we're so prone to, to denial and self-delusion. We're so prone to seeing ourselves not in real light, but in some kind of light that when something doesn't go right, we'll make it about everybody else. So the idea of or good orthodox spirituality would be like, wow, raising the dead is pretty miraculous. Part of the Red Sea is pretty miraculous. Self-reflection is even bigger miracle. Like, who am I? How do I show up? What's going on for me? That kind of work is some of the best work that gets us um, sort of ready for, prepared for, healthy, long, lasting relationships. Okay. So, let me just, um, and let me ask, let me see my phone. Um, how many minutes do, do we have? Unlimited. Unlimited, yeah. <laughs> what would you say, uh, t typically, you guys? Uh, about 9.25. 9.25? 9.25. Okay, cool. Um, I want to mention three things here. Um, I want to mention the idea of boundaries, the idea of worthiness, and the idea of vulnerability. There you go. Let me ask you guys, um, if it, let, let me ask you this, let me ask you to do this. I want to give you two minutes, and if there's a couple people around you, I want you to come up with, if you had to then jump in, I passed out because I had too much goose and too much Lucy, <laughs> and, and, and you guys had to take over based on what you come up with in the next two minutes. What do you think needs to be said about boundaries, whatever your notion is, what does boundaries have to do with getting love right? Or getting it wrong. Okay? When you come up with your theory or your, your explanation, what about boundaries? What does it mean? What what notion do we have about boundaries as it relates to getting love right? Find like two or three people. You have two minutes. I'm gonna start timing you. Ready, set, go. Boundaries. <laughs>
Right, so whatever. I don't know. Right. You have to figure out whether like, we talk about the circle power, like cars, and then you have to look at the circle power. Okay, two minutes are up. Sparks are up. Okay, good. I can go. Let's see. Again, yeah, I know I'm just giving you a little bit of time. Okay, what do we, what can you guys tell me? What What did you guys come up with on boundaries, getting left right, getting left wrong? What do we want to know about boundaries? What do we got? So, so, Cloud and Townsend, our two Christian authors, wrote a book called Boundaries and Dating. And so I'm not going to take credit for this, but what I learned from them is that, and I know you think they are, so totally. correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you imagine yourself, a house with a fence around yourself, um, and in that fence, in that house, you contain all that is good. And all that is, you have a fence around, all that is bad on the outside, but you also have a door in that fence. Yep. So things can go back and put in and out. In and out. So, so check this out. So what they'd say is, I'm very familiar with that book. In fact, I have a couple of quotes from them too. Is one of the things they say about boundaries, and this fits perfectly with what you're saying in, in our little reflection here, is uh, boundaries are there to keep the good in and keep the bad out. Yeah. So the idea of having a boundary means, wow, you must value yourself enough to, to construct a boundary so that if you value your tulips in your front yard and you don't have a fence around it and the kid on the bike next door keeps riding over your tulips, you could then hate every kid on the planet or what do you know, you could build a little fence and it really protects your tulips and you could not hate the kid next door anymore, <laughs> right? So we even say without the boundaries, boy, there's a lot of angst that comes from it. So, and then having the gate is you decide who you let in and who you keep out. Okay. What else do we say about boundaries? That's well done. Um, we were, it was like a two-on-one. I was saying the first most important thing is understanding what your boundaries are yeah. and holding true to them. Mm -hmm. But then just respecting boundaries in general, whether they be yours or another person. Yeah, so we'd say that even skin is a God-given boundary. The basic definition is this is where I, where I end and you begin. And so then we'd say, do I understand myself as my own person? That would be in essence like I have a sense of my boundaries. I have a sense of what I say yes and no to. I have a sense of what's okay for me. Based on knowing myself, I would have some sense of knowing how to draw boundary lines, right? And I'd have self-respect. If a, per a person doesn't have self-respect, what's that say about their, what happens with their boundaries? Ooh, then it's like, get the kid on the bike, go over the tulips. People can come and go, take what they want, right? So that's self-respect. Then we have the other kind of respect, which is, wow, if I'm gonna respect my boundaries, same notion is, I'm gonna respect your personhood. And I'm gonna listen to your yes and no. And if our yeses and nos don't match up, then that's a relationship principle to say, wow, are we, you know, we need to compromise, we certainly need to hear each other, but very often in relationships, if one person, at least one person doesn't have boundaries, then it's like, oh my yes takes over and I don't hear you now anymore. Okay. What else did we come up on boundaries? Any other thoughts on how that plays into relationships? We're getting we, talk, right. we talk about boundaries on time and like on investment, like yeah. how things need to be at equal levels. Yeah, um, kind of a balance thing. Yeah. Um, how can, if I look at boundaries as like even a 20, even time is a boundary, right? And so a 24 hour cycle is a boundary and how do I use my time and, and what do I invest in? And, and am I in charge of my time or in charge of, we could even say, am I in charge of my body? It would be a boundary. Because we can get relationships and if we're not so certain here and there's a big question mark and I'm reflecting on my past failures, and I have anxiety that this relationship's not gonna work. I might even pretend I don't have boundaries anymore because I'm getting signals that what they want is something I'm not comfortable to give, but what, oh, what kicked it again? The fear of losing that relationship. So the fear gets me off my game, 
Now I'm in my head, and now I'm like, ugh. And then the very first answer was inner turmoil on when we get love wrong. Now we have the inner turmoil of like, I'm not comfortable with this, but I might lose them if I say no, or slow down, or not yet. And then next thing we know, we don't have boundaries. In order, that's a fear-driven idea that I would have had boundaries, but I wasn't secure enough to have the boundaries. Okay. So this idea of boundaries then really is quite central, central to getting love right. Any other comments on boundaries? And, and, and yeah, there's a couple things you talked about. Please, One yeah. was uh, uh, you know figuring out how to navigate boundaries where you know, especially in dating, you know, people get to know one another, and if you cross boundaries quickly and then you have to backtrack, there's usually wounding or some sort of hurting that goes on there, you know. Yeah. And so how to navigate it so it's not to hurt one another. And then the other one was uh, the uh, people have generally have uh, sort of levels of boundaries, you know, where they're sort of like acquaintances, friends, family, close connection, you know, that would be like intimate spouse. And so Good. there's different sort of. Good. So we don't have a one size fits all on boundaries. We have different boundaries with different relationships depending on how well we know them, how trust works, um, what they've shown us. We typically have an inner circle, and that boundary would be more transparent. Uh, you know, and a simple way to say that too, I mean, maybe crass way, but if you hook up on the first night, you know, having sex on the first night type of idea, like, oops, bumble strikes again, you know, whatever, <laughs> uh, uh, would be got caught up, went too far, not having enough boundary, and then, and then what happens? Because the actual relationship isn't even established to really give the right infrastructure and, and support to something that occurred that would have happened whew, way down the line. Uh, so even that idea of do we have a sense of our boundaries and even, even a sense of how our notion of what boundaries mean to us personally and what we do on a first date and what we don't do on a first date, what we do or don't do on a tenth date, and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's good on, on a sense of how boundaries show up in different relationships. Was that, did you say there's a second thought, or did you? Was that? Oh, that was two thoughts. Okay, cool, <laughs> good. I don't know if you guys feel comfortable, but I don't know if anybody can share anything about anything you learned about your own boundaries from a relationship situation. Is that, I don't know if that's too personal. I've definitely learned from friends' relationships. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I've definitely learned how I don't want to be Yeah, like, it. yikes, yeah. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Which is actually quite uh, wise of you to pay attention. You know? <clears throat> yeah. Anyone else want to comment on anything you've learned about boundaries? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then over here. Yeah. I think it's really important to have, like, really firm boundaries, like, for yourself. Yeah. Because if you just go out every day and you decide you're going to do whatever you want to do, you're going to catch yourself every next day and like, man, I actually didn't do that Why that do day. That? I should have set up some goalposts or some Yeah, so, so yeah, you know, what's interesting is, you know, if you look at any sport that's played, they usually have the boundary lines figured out before the game, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And think about a sport without the sidelines, without the the end zone or without the foul line. Quidditch. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Quidditch. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is you can't have boundaries for other people because other people, you can't read their mind, you don't know their life. So if they do something that's outside of your rule set, your boundaries, and you don't like it, then you're probably not going to like that person. You're probably going to have a hard time not judging them. Right, so if we encounter someone with different boundaries, it's not about controlling it or judging it, it's about staying true to yours. And that, you know, a lot of faith comes in there because typically we line up some of our boundaries based on our relationship with the Lord. And then we say, then we have, which master will I serve? And it's like, okay, Lord, I know you're with me. And then we start going to that thinking, I know you'll forgive me, ah, you know. Or you know, or we get you know we get pulled. Well, well, this 
it, we're so close and it's gonna be okay. And so sometimes we'll even have you know mind games on what we do with our boundaries. Um, but definitely we have some sense around then getting love right has to do with knowing ourselves well enough on what are healthy boundaries. What ends up if I don't have enough boundary? I wonder, a, a Cloud and Townsend idea here, they came up with what they call the mix up between responsible to and responsible for. It's a little play on words. I don't see if it's, it, if you were married 20 years, you'd be jumping out of your chair on this one because you would have lived a lot of hell uh, already. <laughs> so you may not have experienced the hell yet, but I'll, I'll give you the preview. What they say and what, what research shows is people get this mixed up in relationships. And let's say the, the, the couple is like super close, you know, engaged, yay. Um, <laughs> or they've been married for years. And the common mix up is this between this responsible to and responsible for. So this idea of um, let's leave room for here. Responsible to, responsible for. So the notion here is in a relationship, you're supposed to have you're supposed to have a clarity between what you're responsible to and what you're responsible for. What often happens is it gets flipped, and in super close relationships, it's great they're close, but the mix-up is the one person feels responsible for the other person. Responsible for their happiness. Responsible for what they feel. What might happen or what might go wrong if we feel responsible for what the other person feels? Things. Pressure. pressure, right? So, and I'm going to just illustrate this. Um, if a person feels responsible for the other, then we fall into very common language we use into this whole, you made me mad. You made me mad is actually psychologically, horrifically off base. When we use the term a lot, and if we're using it in a healthy way, what we might mean is what you did triggered me and I'm mad. However, the wires get melted on this, and we get to believing that, oh my God, I ruined their day, I made them mad, or you're awful, you made me mad. The problem with that is, I'll just fast forward. If you study, uh, if you read police reports on domestic violence, literally in the, in the police report, it'll say, um, I warned her, I told her that if she said one more thing, I'd hit her. So she made me do it. Okay, now that's a horrific situation, but the premise is on this confusion. So what often happens is a person is in some awful, foul mood, and the person who feels responsible for it lives a life of walking on eggshells like, I was gonna share my feelings, but I better not, because I'll make them mad. I was gonna have a boundary, but oh my God, they're gonna be so disappointed, I can't do that to them, I better just give it up. Because I'm feeling responsible for them. So the idea is, in a healthy, getting love right relationship, we wanna have a mature person we're with, and mature people learn they're responsible for their own well-being and for their own emotions. And if they're in a bad mood, and it's something we did, but they're in a bad mood, they can have 50 different responses to what I did. I'm not responsible for what they're choosing to do. Whimper, cry, get violent, throw things, stomp out. That's their story. That's their responsibility. So kind of when you do studies on codependency, the codependent would feel responsible for everybody. They'd be over-responsible. And that leads to, there's, there's kind of chemistry in that. They've done studies, over-responsible, if you're prone toward being kind of a people helper, which can be cool. Maybe you might even go across the line into people pleaser. You might know that about yourself. What's often true about you then is that you're typically emotionally over-responsible. When something goes wrong, you just have that pit in your stomach like, oh God, what did I forget? What did I do? It's probably me. And that's quite common. Some of the nicest people are emotionally over-responsible. Who wouldn't love an emotionally over-responsible person? 
right? The chemistry shows, though, that emotionally over-responsible people t tend to get attracted to who? Emotionally under-responsible people. Why is that? Very often, the reason is, back to sports psychology, my sense of value is based on my performance and when I can perform something that makes you feel great, then I feel great. So it sets me up to say, I can feel good only when you feel good about me. So as we think about responsible two, responsible four, the person that's responsible for tends to be over-responsible. So just to get to this point, then we'll make a couple more points. Getting love right would be, you're responsible for yourself. I love you, but your tantrum's not gonna work on me. I can see you have some feelings, it matters to me, but it won't manipulate me. You're responsible for what you're feeling. However, I'm responsible to you. I'm responsible to be honest. I'm responsible to be, to come home at night. I'm responsible to be loving to you. I'm responsible to be supportive. And what the Cloud and Townsend folks say, that they'll compare it based on a scripture from uh, Galatians where it says, carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. At the end of that first verse it says, but each should carry his own load. When you look at the Greek in that, it basically says, uh, carry, each other's back, uh, carry each other's boulders and so fulfill the law of Christ. And the end is, but each should carry his own backpack. So the idea of relationships is we all have a backpack, but we're you know, paying our own bills, we're responsible for my own mood. If I have an anger issue, that's my issue to fix, not for you to walk on eggshells. Carry your own backpack helps us get love right. That's being responsible for. But if a boulder comes along and they, they're just under this big old boulder, we'll rush over and help them because we'll be responsible to help them carry the inordinate load, not the everyday responsibilities, including emotional life. So we want to keep that in mind because sometimes in that chemistry, your attraction is going to do, it, do what it does. And you want to be aware if you're going to have boundaries and getting love right, the love and all the juicy stuff, woo, all the chemistry is there. But sometimes that chemistry makes us blind to what we're responsible for and what we're not responsible for. Okay. Let me just, yeah. Wouldn't you say that boundaries are part of your, um, your mind, your brain, like not your heart? So no, in your zone? Uh, boundaries would be in your heart. Now, it's not that we don't use our mind. And church fathers would teach that, that um, the church fathers would teach sports psychology way before baseball existed, right? Mm -hmm. Well, use me. Mm -hmm. Well, use me. We know about the Lord's me. That is what the church fathers teach when we're way in our head. Interesting what the church fathers teach. They taught that it's driven by two things being in our head. Fear and desire. When we're fear driven, we're in our head. When we're desire driven, we have the addiction hitting us. We want to be aware of these addictive times in life where we're like, oh my God. The Apostle Paul says, the very thing I don't do is what I do and what I don't want to do. It. You know, all that kind of, whoops, how did that happen? That loyalty me, that's in our head. Fear-driven, desire-driven. Fear-driven and desire-driven, what's that say about boundaries? When we're fear-driven and desire-driven, we really have awful boundaries, right? When we're fear-driven, we'll be like, oh, I'm afraid to set a boundary. Someone might not like me. When we're desire-driven, it's like, look out, get out of the way, boundaries. Here I go again, woo! And then we recoil after and have the regret and go, oh my, and have that woozy post addict experience of, how did that happen? Well, you me, fear driven, desire driven. Boundaries right, is in the heart, or what the fathers say is we place our head in our heart. It's in our heart. That, as much as boundaries seem intellectually stable, which it is. It's in the heart because when in the heart we're centered, we go, wow, I'm dying to do that, but I'm gonna have a boundary and not do that. We're actually in the zone to not chase after the curveball. We've seen this spin before. Yep. I think one of the problems why we get so confused about talk of 
being in our heart is because our society tends to conflate the heart with the desire yes. rather than the will. So good. Um, <laughs> huge point. Very often the heart gets relegated, gets relegated to like just those silly emotions that we get pulled around by. But interestingly, if we understand from an Orthodox perspective, being pulled around by impulses and desires is of the head, and emotions then come from the way we think. If we have sick thinking, we'll have, if we have distorted thinking, we're gonna have inflamed feelings. If we have an inflamed feeling of uh, depression, or inflamed feeling of anxiety, we didn't just, we didn't just inherit that feeling that feeling came from a distorted thought. And the distorted thought is, I don't think I can hit a curveball. I don't think I can be successful in relationships. That's a distorted thought, it's a distorted negative thought. From it, then, we get inflamed feelings of self-doubt and anxiety. So the boundaries actually would be the centered person has a sense of who they are and not getting driven around by fear and desire. Can't you also have too many boundaries, like unrealistic, not personal boundaries in your heart? Great, 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 great point. There's a book called Mindset. It's a pretty good book. What it gets at, as an example, it makes me think of it, is, and this is actually true in like religious settings. Some people who are attracted to religious settings are actually rigid thinkers. But what that book calls a fixed mindset. So boundaries are not meant to be rigid. We have to be very careful. It takes a lot of discernment. That sometimes we, we get all the boundaries in place and what we actually built was a barricade. And we're not dealing with our past pain because we're afraid to get it wrong again and we want to get it right. And we get such a labyrinth of maze of boundaries that the poor sap that makes it through all that is probably dead on arrival. <laughs> okay? So we have to be aware of boundaries are meant to keep the good in and keep the bad out. It's not meant to keep people out or love out or even some amount of some amount of risk, some amount of vulnerability. But yes, sometimes we'll call it boundaries. And some people who are just plain rigid and controlling will be like, oh, no, it's my boundary, I don't do that. But I'm bleeding on the street, no, no, no. You know, like, you're like, oh, they call that boundary? Wow. So, again, like anything else, we could use all the right terms uh, and use it wrong. Okay? All right, so I think we have a sense of having boundaries helps us get uh, love right. Um, and just almost in a way of, of uh, review, in the ways in which we use boundaries, we could have... Uh, different personality types. We get the compliant person, and a compliant person is saying yes to everything because they're afraid to say no. A compliant person is a people pleaser. They'll have a hard time. Whereas some people, they'll be boundary busters. They don't even hear the words that set boundaries, and they're controllers. We want to be aware of controlling personalities. We might have some people who just avoid, and they're just like, anytime conflict is coming, they don't set up, they, they don't even stick around for it. They're afraid to show up to it. Okay? So moving right along because we've got So I'm gonna just make two more points here on worthiness and vulnerability. Now I'm gonna give you um, I'm gonna give you because we have I'm gonna give you one minute. I want you to turn to a person next to you. What in the world does worthiness, our own worthiness, have to do with getting love right? Let me see if we come, it's a it's a pop quiz. What is worthiness, our sense of worthiness? How does that affect how we get love right or not? Ready, set, go. Find that person. Worthiness. Your We're talking about one or inner sense of worthiness, like Carol. Uh, so, like, how much work I place on you, but how much work I think of myself. Like, if I think of myself, I might not enter 
and I make that so purpose so because, because I just have a I just have a Or I think so much of myself is so worthy. Okay, what do you think about worthiness? What are we coming up with? I know it's quick, but worthiness, what, what are we talking about? When it comes to getting love right. Knowing your own value and what you'll accept with you to accept. Okay, so we're really back in here with a big question mark. To the extent that we have some sense of our own value, that's going to play out in a relationship. To the extent that we have low worthiness, that's going to play out in relationships. What else did you guys have? Any other little thoughts on that? We're saying that you should know your self worth because if you don't think you're worthy of love or respect, you're going to attract the people who will abuse the fact that you don't have self worth. Um, totally. To have a like good, loving relationship, you want to know that you're worthy enough, not just for the love of the human, but for the love of God. So, one of those reflections would be in our desire to get love right. We want to have a sense of getting worthiness right. And there'd be kind of a correlation that the lower sense of worthiness in here sets us up for an interesting dynamic, which means the person who doesn't have a lot of worthiness here has a long history of not having worthiness here, which means there's already been some patterns of belief that would say, it's not here, so if I, if I have any chance, I'm going to find my worthiness out there. Sometimes that comes in the form of what relationship we're trying to find. When we have low sense of worthiness here, we've already established that that wreaks havoc on the boundary situation, because low worthiness here would typically be indistinct or not established boundaries. But the other point we can make is that the idea of understanding addiction is trying to solve inside problems with outside things. Basic definition of addiction is trying to solve inside problems with outside things. So a little sense of worthiness would be we don't even try to grow or build anything or repair anything in here, we're searching out here. There's a great little, some of you have heard me share this from the church fathers many years ago, where the fathers teach, the teaching of the Orthodox Church fathers may be summarized by this parable. In the city, there was a courtesan. You guys know what a courtesan is? It's like the most popular prostitute in town. In the city, there was a courtesan who had many lovers. The governor came to her and said, if you promise to be good, I'll marry you. She promised, and the governor brought her to his home. But her former lovers said to each other, that ruler took her to his house. Let's go to the back of the house and whistle for her. Then when she recognizes the whistle, she'll come down. When she heard the whistle, she stopped her ears and withdrew to an inner chamber, shutting the door fast behind her. Abba John explains that the courtesan represents our soul. Her lovers are the passions. The governor is Christ. The, eternal, the inner chamber is the eternal dwelling. Those who whistled are the demons. Behold how this soul took refuge in the Lord. Here we have an ancient orthodox description of addiction, and that is... Our passions, our sufferings, our desires, uh, our attempt to find love in all the wrong places is going to be whistling, and we know the sound of the whistle. And we've probably even taken that journey out here trying to feel some sense of value. And so we want to see that in this sense of worthiness that, again, in our spiritual walk and in good, healthy psychology, we'd say, 
there is a there is a home here that we're supposed to return to. The parable of the prodigal son is we go off to the foreign land and we squander who we are, and then it says we we hang out in the pig pen long enough. And we go, what the heck? And then scriptures say when he came to himself, he stood up and turned toward the father and went back home, and stopped going out here to find his sense of worthiness. And so we have both the spiritual health. And this is where Christ dwells in our heart, as well as where you're welcomed to live in your own heart, being who you are, being who you're called to be, finding your calling, your purpose, and being true to that. Otherwise, if we're not living in here, the whistles are going to come, and we're going to go out that back door and then go, what's happening with my life? And so this idea of worthiness plays a big role. This idea of, in our Christian walk, and really the deepest part of our psychology is meant to intersect with the deepest part of our theology, that our worthiness comes from that connection from a life giver who just who breathes life into us every single day. Just to close our time, because we're out of time, but just to say this, this, this whole idea of vulnerability and what we do with it. Very often, and us men are super guilty of this, we equate vulnerability with weakness. We equate vulnerability with run for the hills. We, create, we equate vulnerability with covered up. And the idea of good, healthy vulnerability is that you have permission to be you, courage to be you. Getting love right very often is finding people around you where the connection has healthy boundaries, where the people are we may have you know, our issues, but we're having some sense of our own worthiness and getting love right and really deeply getting it right is being willing to be vulnerable in a safe relationship and they're willing to be vulnerable. It's not some like, oh, I got the right relationship with the right one because I, I somehow got it right. Getting love right is the outcome of a life where we're committed to healthy boundaries, working on our sense of worthiness. And keep in mind, the sense of worthiness, big mix up in the younger generation. It's always been there, but I'm seeing it like on fire, which is just this mix up between shame and guilt. Guilt is I feel bad about what I did. Shame is I feel bad about who I am. So what's common is when we encounter our own vulnerable flaws, we feel awful or someone else sees us make a mistake and hits the nerve because we have the mix up between shame and guilt. Typically, when we accidentally mix it up and get into shame, then heck no, I'm not gonna let you too close because if you see the uglies that I know about, then you're gonna hate me as much as I hate me. That's a shame-based thought. So even as we untangle that and say, wow, my worthiness is in Christ and my worthiness is just in my humanity and we're on an even playing field to have our own flaws, and that relationship with boundaries, sense of worthiness, and this very courageous and actually compassionate. Let me close with this. Simply to say, in just the political scheme of what's going on today, so much judgment going on, is that we want to keep in mind, very common in the world of vulnerability, is that when we see people's flaws, we tend to view it as almost disqualifying them. And the unhealthier we are with our own lack of worthiness, it actually makes us really good candidates to actually be quite judging because to the extent we judge here, we're eventually gonna judge there. So I just wanna make that point of, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be challenged with the people you encounter in each other, but after a while, you're, you're gonna be stopped seeing them as a person and you'll just see their flaws. What often happens is divorce rate is high after 25 years because at some point the flaws in the people is all they're seeing in each other. Most conflicts in, 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 um, in parenting, a lot of parents blame it on their crazy teenagers. But part of it is the kid's been around enough to show their flaws and the parent is sick of it and the kid has been around their parents seeing their flaws and they're sick of it and they're no longer seeing each other's people. I want to close with this one thought, and it was something I heard from uh, Deacon Stephen Muse, who's a Christian psychologist who's Orthodox now. He's a Presbyterian pastor. Now he's a deacon in the church back in 
Georgia or somewhere. Author, really amazing. And he was speaking at a marriage conference that I was speaking at. He was talking about intimacy. He's saying that intimacy really gets lost in, in marriage over time. He says one of the reasons why, he says you have to understand the Latin word for disciple. And we said the Latin word for disciple is the word pupil. I, oh, I trip out on that word. I flash back to second grade because my second grade teacher would call us pupils. And it bugged the crap out of me. It's like, why in the world is she calling us pupils? I'm like seven years old. Why are you calling us pupils? But I had to just accept it. I couldn't control it. I guess I'm a, I didn't even know why. But like, I equated some idea that pupil is student, I guess. Well, all those years later, I fast forward to Deacon Stephen Muse's talk, and he says, the most intimate intimacy in relationships. He says the most intimate relationship is like a disciple relationship. With a discipler, and a, you know, mentor, mentee, they get each other. And he says that kind of intimate relationship, as he was comparing it to marriage, is the word disciple because it means pupil, because that kind of relationship is a pupil to pupil relationship. It's a relationship where I see you and I don't judge you. You feel seen in your most flawed day. A relationship that is very aware of differences, and yet I see you as a person. I don't see you as a collection of defects. I see you as a person. One of the most intimate relationships we could have, even with friends, is feeling seen. So as we think about boundaries, worthiness, and vulnerability really connects with this idea of having a life where you let people see you. And there's an energy to that. There's a vibe to that. Be seen. Be okay with who you are. Let you be you. Let it be seen. And someone else wants to be seen. And there's a special chemistry that happens there. So with that, I'll wrap up. And thank you for your good attention. And thanks for dinner, guys.